So our last presentation of the three on um, community uh, programming uh, in this area in Scotland uh, comes from Tayside, and i um, happy to introduce Anne Erickson. Um, and uh, is a senior specialist in public health with a long and uh, distinguished background in, uh, right to the national level, in uh, sexual health and bloodborne virus control. Um, and her partner today in the presentation um, is Felicity Snowsell, who's worked uh, in Zimbabwe in HIV prevention um, as well uh, and support, as well as in service provision and tobacco control in Tayside and is now project manager for the uh, health, Community Health Collaborative on Teenage Pregnancy in Tayside. So welcome. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you very much for that um, very kind um, introduction. Um, I'm Anne Erickson, as John Franks has said, and um, what, what I'm going to do um, at, at the start of the presentation, again, it's, it's a double header here, so we've um, split the, the presentation. I'm going to um, do the bit of the boring bit, um, uh, setting the scene, um, but um, I think the really interesting bit, and hopefully um, you, you, will, you will agree with that, um, is that we're really trying to do things differently um, in in Tayside and, and pick up the challenge that, that, that Harry has been encouraging all of us to do. And Felicity is going to be sharing um, some of the emerging experience that we have from taking one of the asset-based approaches um, in, in, in Tayside, the Healthy Community Collaborative. So in, in terms of um, setting the scene, um, teenage pregnancy, many of you will be aware, teenage pregnancy and supporting um, young women and their children um, is an integral part of what we need to be doing to improve outcomes, um, in particular for vulnerable children um, and young people. And it's an example of one of those inequalities that has really been stubborn to change. Um, we, we know that teenage pregnancy rates um, in, in Scotland have been um, largely um, static over the last decade. Um, and it's a really important issue because it passes some of those disadvantages that we talked about this morning on from one generation um, to, to the next. Um, what we've begun to recognise is that um, continuing to do some of the things that we've been doing, um, the same things, is just going to result in, in, in more, more of the same. So locally in, in Tayside, in, in recent years, what we um, attempt to do is to look very hard at the emerging evidence around what does work, um, and equally what, what doesn't work. And much of that evidence, as we heard this morning, um, is international, in particular um, from, from the US. The evidence base and, and it is clearly extraordinarily important, but it's only one part of the equation of how we need to be approaching this issue. And I think what we recognised um, a couple of years ago was that we needed a much, much better understanding of what locals, ex local people's experience, and in particular young people's experience and beliefs around teenage um, pregnancy and um, risk-taking behaviours more generally are. But above all, it's about supporting young people and young parents to um, shape and lead those solutions um, so that they're, they're the right things um, for people living in, in local communities. Teenage pregnancy, for teenage pregnancy, certainly the Healthy Community Collaborative that, that Felicity is going to talk, talk about really for us marks the start of a much, much more collaborative way of working and a very different way of engaging um, with communities. And it's aiming very much to put uh, the strengths and assets and experiences of local people at the heart of developing um, shared and what we hope to be much more uh, sustainable um, solutions. Pregnancy, um, as many of you in the room will know, and in the very young, is a significant and long-standing um, concern. It's been the focus of um, Scottish Government policy, um, first, firstly in Respect and Responsibility, which was published in, in, in the mid-2000s, um, and more recently, again, with the Sexual Health and Bloodborne Virus Framework, which was published uh, last year, which re-emphasises the link um, between inequality and, and teenage pregnancy, and the importance very much of, of early and intervention, um, and it restates the Scottish Government's aim to reduce teenage pregnancy, especially in, in the more deprived um, communities. This, um, which I, I openly acknowledge is a, a very messy um, slide, um, 
is it, it, it comes from work that was done by the Department of Health um, Teenage Pregnancy Unit in England. Um, and really, it's there to um, demonstrate in diagrammatical form um, that teenage pregnancy um, is a very complex um, issue. And it's influenced by a lot of the life circumstances that we heard about this morning, um, social, economic and, and cultural factors uh, that influence um, young people's lives and, and their behaviours. Um, and often those um, factors are um, inter interrelated, as you can as, as you can see from from the diagram. We heard this morning that um, young women um, with multiple risk factors are at much heightened risk um, of of teenage pregnancy. I think the thing that's important to say, and we've heard that from from the the last two um, speakers, is that that some of the factors that you see up here in terms of um, low self-esteem, um, peer influence, the, the, the influence of alcohol and substance misuse, um, low levels of, of aspiration, disengagement from school, um, family circumstances, um, all of those issues are not unique in any way whatsoever to teenage pregnancy. And we know that they're often associated with other poor health and social outcomes, um, in particular substance misuse, um, educational attainment, and, and issues like um, youth offending. So very much what, what we need to be doing, what we need to be taking out of this, is that the roots of those things are, are, are similar, and the preventative interventions that we need to be taking are, need to be broad uh, as we were advised this morning. This um, is um, some local um, data. Um, it's a table with the um, data zones in, in Tayside um, ranked in descending order, um, which shows the, the percentage of, of first-time mothers who were aged um, 19 or, 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 or um, younger. Um, and it's important here that whilst Scottish Government um, emphasis very much has been on younger teenage pregnancies in under um, 16s, in, in Tayside we've taken the approach that we're focusing on under 20s because that's where um, the evidence would suggest the impact um, is, is still um, detrimental for, for the young women and also, also, also for their children. And I suppose it's easier to see if you look at it in this graph um, form, um, which draws the um, strong associations that there are between um, teenage pregnancy and deprivation, um, which we, we again heard about this morning um, with the um, areas of highest deprivation um, on, on, on your uh, left, I think, um, something I can never do, um, and um, the more affluent areas in, in, uh, on, the, on, the far, on the far side, where we know that, that young, young women are um, ten times more likely in, if they're living in the most deprived um, areas um, of Tayside, and indeed in the UK, um, to become teenage mums um, under, under 20 than their more affluent uh, counterparts. <coughs> Okay, so, so why um, does it matter? Um, and I think it, it is very important to say, and I think Felicity might, might talk about some of the, the um, experiences that, that young people have, have shared with us locally, and it is really important to say that um, although teenage pregnancy very much can be a positive and life-changing, life-enhancing experience for individual young women, it is strongly associated with a range of adverse outcomes, both for, for the, the young women um, themselves, um, and that is that often their education is interrupted and it's sometimes quite difficult. Um, there are barriers for, for young women to get back into education. They're much more likely um, as a teenage mum to be bringing up their child on their own and, and, and in poverty. Um, we know that they are much more likely to smoke um, during pregnancy with all the ramifications um, for health that that has on, on the unborn baby. Um, they're much less likely um, to breastfeed. And there are, there are um, associations with um, much higher rates of um, postnatal depression um, than, than there are in older mums. And um, they have a higher risk of um, poorer mental health um, in the years um, immediately after the birth of, of the baby. For the children of teenage mums, we also know that they are much more likely to experience diminished life circumstances. They're at increased um, 
chance themselves um, of living in, in poverty in, in their own adulthood and increased um, risk of low educational attainment with the implications that that has for risk-taking behaviour in, in adolescence and um, at increased risk of, of poor, poor health and are much more likely themselves to be living um, in adulthood in um, in poverty. And um, we know that being the child of a teenage mum is the biggest predictive factor in terms of whether or not you will you will go on yourself to, to be to be to be a teenage parent. As I've mentioned that the, the rates of teenage pregnancy are much higher in the most deprived communities. Um, and the important thing about that is that, that the poorer outcomes um, also mean that those effects are, are passed on from one generation to, to the next. So it's very important in terms of what we're doing around promoting um, the um, wider um, work in terms of tackling um, inequalities um, and improving um, the outcomes for children and young people and making sure that they genuinely do get the best um, start in, in life. Going back to that sort of rather um, messy slide and the, the work that we did in, in Tayside, it's very difficult to know where on earth do you start. It can feel like a juggernaut is kind of heading your way and rather fast. And uh, as many of you might well know, um, NHS Tayside has um, had the um, uh, highest rates of teenage pregnancy in, in, in the country for some considerable time. So it has been a major um, concern of the NHS and, and all, of, all of our local authority partners. Um, I'm glad to say that uh, um, in the last four years we are beginning to see that the, an impact from some of the work that we're doing and we've, we've seen sustained and quite significant reductions in teenage pregnancy across all the age groups. But what, what we were... Um, challenge to do really was to look at well, what is it that the evidence is telling us and what should we be doing differently um, and historically and what, what this is attempting to do is to put some logic around um, looking at what the evidence was telling us and the factors that we know that are associated with teenage pregnancy and again the protective factors that colleagues have talked about um, and looking at well, what is it that we should actually be, be doing in order to um, have some impact uh, around that issue locally. In terms of um, policy focus, um, historically um, in Scotland, um, we very much focused around the two middle boxes um, uh, in, in pink and, and in green, and that is that very much around young people um, having um, the opportunity to make much more informed decisions about their sexual health, so very much linked to um, making sure that they have access to high quality information and access to um, good sex and relationships education that's very much working with, with, with their skills. Um, and also in the green box that we have young people focused um, sexual health services um, so that they have the means by which to actually um, protect themselves and, and, and prevent um, unplanned, unplanned pregnancy and um, transmission of sexually transmitted um, diseases. But from the most recent evidence um, that, that has, has come out um, looking at, at, at the experience in the States, if that's all we do, and if that's what we concentrate on, we're really not going to make any difference um, to um, teenage pregnancy. What the most recent evidence is um, very strongly um, supportive of is the things that really make a difference are um, impacting on um, the first years of, of, of a child's life, so improving early childhood experience um, and development. And there's a number of things that we know we should be doing um, around that, not least of which is that some of the things like um, the pregnant women um, under 20 being identified and offered the sort of um, intensive and strength-based um, support um, for, for during the pregnancy in the first two years of life, which we're fortunate in Tayside in being the second pilot site, um, along, with, along with Edinburgh, of the Family Nurse Partnership being able to offer that. Colleagues have also mentioned um, parenting skills programmes um, that, that, that we are also sponsoring. The, the other area that we know that makes a big difference is around uh, the work that needs to happen to make sure that young people and young adolescents 
um, have the opportunity to increase our expectations and aspirations and very much sort of build on um, their um, social capital, their self-efficacy. Um, and those two things um, we know work because they actually tackle um, the root causes, the broad determinants um, of, of early parenthood. So we need to work much better um, with young people, um, with the parents uh, and with communities to bring their experiences together with the evidence that we have um, to develop shared solutions. So I'm going to hand over to um, Felicity, who's going to talk to us about one of the, the sort of practical ways that we're trying to implement that locally through the Healthy Community Collaborative. And that is very much about listening to young people, working with people in their own communities, um, sharing some of the evidence that we have so that we're sharing the knowledge that Harry talked about so that it's, it's coming out of that box which is specialist and, and, and sacrosanct to um, professionals um, and working with people to, to share, to, uh, to share uh, developed solutions. Um, Harry talked earlier also about lighting the fire in communities and I would like to see certainly and I, I, I would recognise that Felicity in Tayside is, is probably one of the matches um, that we need very much to, to light those fires. No pressure then. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Healthy Communities Collaborative Project focusing on teenage pregnancy. And like this presentation and our language today, um, it's emerging and, and developing. And when I say teenage pregnancy, we only have to look back at the diagram Anne had up, that really messy diagram. And, and everybody here who works with young people knows it's not just about one thing and that when you start talking to young people, it's much, much bigger. And so the background to the project, I think sexual health, cross-agency, anyone who works with young people knows that um, sexual health is always identified as a priority with young people. I'm going to zip through this, you know, the background, Anne's covered a lot of it, but we've got the um, new sexual health and BBV framework. We've got the change in leadership to local authority, which has opened the door to further partnership work. Um, we have the concurrent kind of move towards the asset-based approaches, which again gives us an, more opportunities to work with communities and with professionals. Um, we're very lucky in Tayside that we have um, an excellent piece of primary research by Juana Petku, who is a trainee health psychologist, and we can make that available to people, who did um, some work that was specifically focused in Dundee, talking to young people and the people that look after them, both professionally and within the communities. Um, and then also we have in person Kinross the success of the Healthy Communities Collaborative Project um, that works with older people in Perth and Kinross. And I'll come back to explaining exactly what that is. But in Perth and Kinross, you can see we have uh, lots of involvement from older people and, and the benefits of the work that came out on evaluation were all the things that we're looking for. Um, reducing isolation, promoting mental well-being, active aging, improved social capital, and promoting resilience. <coughs> so, the Healthy Communities Collaborative Project um, really had the Tayside, or I was given the Tayside remit to establish teams, healthy community collaborative teams. What does that mean? <coughs> the methodology um, for the Healthy Communities Collaborative is an evaluated and evidence-based action model. It works with communities and partnership agencies to develop sustainable interventions. And it's based on the evidence. So the framework is about sharing that evidence. And that's really, really important because and I'll come on to this again. You know, if you start talking about the evidence-based teenagers, you know, you can see it's that whole thing about enjoyment and engaging and getting young people on board. And if you start talking to young parents about multiple areas of, de you know, areas of multiple deprivation, and if you start talking to them about, you know, negative outcomes, the first thing they're going to say is, you know, I'm a good mum, you, you're criticising me. And, and that's really important that we have to find good ways to share that evidence. Because if we are going to work with communities, we've got to um, respect the fact that they need to know what does work and, and what, what the research is saying. Because, you know, it's there and we have to follow that. 
But the basic model is engage with the community and the key workers, so that's the people who have the relationships, um, build a team made up of workers and community members, and in my case, it's young people, train and work with that team to build their capacity, and then look at shared solutions and try them out. And if they don't work, try something else. It's a bit of a, it's not rocket science approach. And it's all based on this um, plan, do, study, act kind of cycle, which I'm sure some of you are familiar with. Story so far, um, and it is an emerging story. Uh, when I started the job, it was very much like, OK, I can do this. And then you know, every day you're thinking, OK. But every time I go into work, you know, every week, something small happens to just move the whole thing forward. And, you know, and I go away at the end of the week thinking, OK, this is going to work. Um, we established a, a steering group um, that was made up from people from all three um, areas of Tayside, but also um, cross-partnership. Um, we had professional events in three areas, which were um, great, actually, because over 45 people came to all of these events. They were not the usual suspect. Um, we used these events to um, disseminate the evidence, the research that we'd done, to look at the Healthy Communities Collaborative Model, because not everybody is familiar with it. Um, but also, we used it to take people with us. So it was about consulting and getting people on board and saying, we can't do this without you. We have to work together. Um, and the sign-up was fantastic, I have to say, because I think everybody right across all the different agencies recognizes that it is you know, a really big issue in, in, in many ways, um, the recognition that everyone has a part to play. Um, Pure Media UK. Um, so I went into this thinking, OK, how are we going to do this? And coming back to that enjoyment thing, how do you actually engage with young people? How do you talk to them about the way that um, the, the negative outcomes of having sex and then a baby, when actually, you know, as uh, someone was saying earlier, it's meant to be a really good part of our lives. And you have to kind of tap into the creativity in that. So what I did was I um, took some tips from people that I worked with, and I've started working with an organization who trains up young people to work with other young people using creative media. and and. That's been a really good move, actually. Um, so I'm using a working group of young people through this organization, um, training them up on the research, and using that whole creative approach with drama and film and poetry to help me engage with the teams that I'm setting up. And then finally, um, I've been trying to establish groups in the different areas. And those groups, and I'll come on to it later because, it, again, it's been an evolving thing and things have changed, but those groups initially came out of the discussions that we had with the professionals and the key workers in the different areas, the local knowledge that those people brought to say, actually, you know, we think we'd like you to work here because we have this particular issue, or we think it would be good to work here because we have an organization that is already doing that work and you could build on it. Um, adapting the model. It's one thing to go into Perthshire and work with older people around shopping, um, falls, uh, you know, um, how to use a mobile phone. All of those things were hugely relevant and were done through consultation. But again, that whole thing about how do you actually adapt it so that young people are interested in, in taking part? Um, and I think that, I think, again, what comes into it is the importance of recognizing that people have a right to the evidence base and a right to the research. Um, again, going back to, to what we were saying at the beginning of the day, young people's stories are at the heart of everything we do. And in, in my pre-work, um, I listened to people and some of the stories that came up. And I think this is really important and has been important in shaping the, the work that we've done. And it will come out again and again, but in young women who won't go to the sexual health clinic because she can't fill in the form, so that the literacy issues are a really huge thing. Um, and again, the literacy issues when you're a young mum and you either get a copy of what could be Cosmopolitan or you get a telephone directory that is actually 
um, designed for people with special needs. How humiliating is that? You know, you have to walk out of the clinic with this. Um, you know, there are lots of things that we could be doing there. Um, a young woman who found out before she found a tra who thought before she found a training place that her only option was prostitution. She started having sex when she was 13, and she thought, well, I'm good at that. I'll just keep doing it. Um, now she's actually got a placement. Uh, she's working in catering, and she's not sexually active anymore. So that's a, a really, and that's down to a very good relationship with a key worker. Um, but it, you know, it tells a story, doesn't it? Young fathers um, often missed out of the equation for lots and lots of reasons. We have a website in uh, Tayside called Cruel to Talk, which is just for young people. They can get their questions answered um, anonymously. Um, it's very well used. This is a question from a 15-year-old who's expecting his second son. Lots of issues. OK, how did we do it? We engaged with the key agencies. Just look at my notes. <laughs> um, and it can't be underlined more how important that partnership work is. Without the relationships that people already have with the young people that we want to work with, we can't do the work. Um, relationships has come up again and again today, um, and we can't do that without it. Turning the research and the evidence base into an accessible form and adapting the model, um, this is where we've done uh, We've used pure media. We've you know, recognized that literacy is often an issue. We're going to use drama and discussion. Um, we're going to use uh, filmmaking. We're going to use different ways to actually engage. And we're going to have this core group of young people who are going to be leading um, on that initial engagement with guidance from ourselves and, with, most importantly, with support from key workers who work with the young people. And then we're going to uh, use this to start a conversation with the young people and the communities they live in, and we're going to work with them to try out stuff that makes a difference. Um, quick timeline. We've kind of moving through it, and this is, again, sits within the framework of the Healthy Community Collaboratives method. Um, we've done the research and identified the issues. We've I mean, I've slightly have had to adapt the model, but we, we've started to establish the teams, um, have the engagement workshops. We're coming into the action period where we'll be developing those teams and working with them. We're hoping to bring things together in May. Um, we're going to do some more work that hopefully will build on the first ideas that come together at the first summit. And then by October, um, we'll be able to share some of the practice that we've done. Um, it all sounds very neat. We've got a, a tight timeline um, because I'm on a secondment, which finishes in, in November. So we've, we've, we've got to kind of pack it all in. Um, here are just some photographs showing professionals coming together and, and discussing and, and looking at the evidence base at the professional meetings. Um, this is the most interesting slide, really, for me, because this is what's happening. And, it's chain, it changes. Every week it changes, but it, it's coming together. Um, when I started, uh, we kind of identified you know, different areas that would be good to work in. And, and we were looking at things that, were, that would be easy. You know, where were the open doors? Um, what was the evidence base? You know, where should we be working? Um, we've set up several groups. We started off working in Whitfield, uh, with a, which is um, an area of Dundee with a group of local women who were already involved in community development. But most of them, many of them, were teenage mums at one point. Um, we're working with that group, and they are going to, in turn, work with a group of quite vulnerable young girls from a local school in that area. And that's kind of been developing on its own. Um, through the Pure Media Working Group, um, we started working with young people who have been or are looked after. That didn't really work as well as we thought it would for, for many different reasons, and I, I, we will come back to it. But out of that <coughs> came Michael's story. Um, Michael's a young lad who was a uh, very uh, vulnerable past, drugs, alcohol, um, ADH, you know, all these things that combine. Uh, got very drunk, made his girlfriend, or got pregnant, his girlfriend got pregnant, 
They didn't really have a very solid relationship. It was based on substance use. Michael actually turned his whole life around. And um, the Pure Media Group, the working group, um, spent a day with Michael, um, and they, did, they made a really great little film about his experience and speaking to him. One of the biggest things that came out of that for me was that he said, he said the, biggest, the, the best thing that's happened to him with his child is that his little boy came in and he just said, he said, I love you, Daddy. And he said, I love you too. And then the little boy turned around and said, I love you, Granny and Grandpa. And Michael said, he said, nobody ever said that to him. You know, he just, he was in that situation where he'd never had that response from his parents. And I, I think that just speaks volumes. But anyway, the exciting thing about that is that Michael's story is going to be turned into uh, a drama with a group, um, and hopefully that's going to engage with a group of young fathers. Um, we've got a school-based group which we're working on, and then different other groups that are, um, sorry, school-based group, and different groups in different parts of Tayside as well. Um, the other thing that's emerged from that, and again, it's this whole thing that it's very organic, you know, things just keep happening. And we took the workshop that the young people had devised and we tried it out on a, a group of three or four young mums and uh, one young girl who was pregnant. And that has actually led to that group being established. Um, we're going to put in for funding for the Cash for Communities funding. And that group is going to be nurtured. Um, we're going to work with them and hopefully they're going to feed into the work that we're doing with the other groups. So uh, lots of stuff going on there. Uh, and, and as we were saying, we don't really know what's going to happen, and, and we have to be ready for change the whole time. Uh, just some photographs of, of working together with the groups. Um, just to finish off, um, Four things I just wanted to kind of summarize. Learning, it, it's about very small steps. You know, those things that you think you can do in six months, put it into two years. You know, everything that you do, every meeting that you set up, because it involves real people in real life, you're a very, very small part of that. You know, so it is really about just taking very small steps and listening and just being very willing to, to let it take its course. Um, and you have to be really, really flexible. People don't turn up, or they, too many of them turn up, or they change the dates, or, you know, and, and you have to listen because that is that whole thing about working with people and, and co-production. It has to be led by them. Um, and I think it, it's really important to be prepared to admit if things aren't working and, and let them evolve um, in the way that we kind of said, okay, this isn't actually working, but let's take this part of it and, and see if we can make it better. Um, support that just to reiterate without working in partnership without the strategic buy-in but also the buy-in from operational staff and staff who have those relationships with young people and with the communities we couldn't do it um, i've been working with the dundee healthy living initiative which already has a presence and a record of excellent work working in the community of whitfield and and without them you know they were my door in, into working in that community and they have the relationship and they have the trust and we have to build on that we're not kind of parachuting in we're building on the work that's already there um challenges and risks working with the community and young people is hugely unpredictable as you were as you know um we want to work we want to work with the more vulnerable young people, but sometimes we have to work with the more engaged people and young people to reach those who are more vulnerable. Um, and I think one of the hardest things is that professionals and adults have to accept that this will endeavor to be young people-led. Um, and that doesn't always take a known or obvious path. Um, and it's not, it's not, people aren't willing to do that letting go and, and let it evolve. But it's also our job to make sure that it, it stays very focused, that we are looking at the evidence base and we help take that forward. Um, and then finally, the opportunities, the need to let things grow and develop. Um, already, it's growing arms and legs, and, and it's always evolving. And that's what's really exciting about the work. And that's it. <laughs>